Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. This is Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? So, um, just simple whiskey tonight. Yeah. Good old Turkey 101. Yeah. That, that's my go-to. Like, I mean, if that's just... There's always a bottle of that in my house. <laughs> yeah. If you want to refer to like an over-the-counter type of whiskey, that's my that's yeah. my choice too. Absolutely. Um, I I went back to the rye whiskey tonight. I'm I was digging that. And, I like the rye. I mean, the rye is normally what I go to first, yeah. but I was like, oh, I haven't had turkey in a while. <laughs> you like that Templeton? That's so. Oh sweet. man, is it Templeton? It's Templeton. Yeah, yeah. I, I keep a bottle of that at the house too. And let me tell you, that stuff's like cotton candy, man. Yeah. It, I love when you, it. When you make a, a Manhattan with it, it actually tastes like cotton candy. <laughs> yeah, it is, man. Um, that stuff is so sweet. I can't I can't do that one. And I love it. Uh, I can't do that I one. think I killed the bottle you had in there. You probably don't have any more. I think I no, drank I, it all. No, I don't. And I, I didn't replace it. <laughs> I need, it I need to gift me. you another bottle of that so I have it here. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, yeah. That'll, that works, I suppose. Um, well, we didn't, we didn't quite make it recording last week. Yeah, you can look uh, at me on that one. Okay. Got it. Um, and, but there's a, it's a shame too because there's plenty to talk about, and now it kind of feels like old news. But we're gonna address it anyway. We won't cover it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I, I guess the uh, and actually this is even older than that. I may as well start with the oldest thing on my little list of stuff to that I'd like to talk about. Um. And this is I found this really interesting, and actually it might relate to the to the inter, the uh, Grant Smith interview that I was talking to you about oh, earlier. Yeah. Um. So. On France 24 and apparently on the BBC, No, no Agenda Show played a, uh, um, a cut of this report from the BBC. I saw it on France 24. Uh, they released um, a report from the Syria Justice and Accountability Center um, that is uh, implicating the Assad government in a bunch of uh, criminal activity and human rights abuses. And they did it with a fancy... Um, like animated graphic thing, you may have seen one of these before. Yeah, they always do those with the airplanes. That's that's what I think of. Yeah, uh, well, I, yeah, I mean that's among thing. See the okay, so there's those two, always bother me. By the way. yeah, they bother me too. It was like really professionally done this this release, and to me, it's not to to express any like faith in the benevolence of the Assad government or anything. Right. Like, so don't take this the wrong way. Um, I would not be remotely surprised if the Assad government was involved in this criminal activity. In fact, I, I think it's almost a certainty that the that Assad were. government was involved in criminal activity and human rights abuses. They certainly were willing to, to torture prisoners for us in the UK during the Iraq war. So yeah. um, they're not, a, they're not above this. Yeah, is what you're saying. I don't see yeah. any reason why they wouldn't do it in their own war. Right. <laughs> um, but all the same, um, I, I just I started doing some a little bit of digging because I just think of these uh, these kind of government um, propaganda releases that do these little graphics like yeah, yeah, this, yeah. and so um, they got these documents presumably uh, between 2013 and 2015, uh, mostly in in northern Syria um, that they had liberated after they drove out government forces and and then the okay i won't call them the jihadis the the rebels the rebel forces uh, yeah. in syria allowed these groups to go in and uh, and get documents really that's the story that's the story okay. yeah um <laughs> that's what we're going with and so the the syria justice and accountability center and um the commission for international justice and accountability uh are where are the sources of these documents in terms of like who who got them together for this report that the SJAC put out. Okay. Now, both of these are NGOs. They're American NGOs. Uh, and they're both funded at least partially by the U.S. State Department. Yeah. And the... I, I couldn't find the origin of the um, the CIAJA, but the Syria Justice and Accountability Center, its um, its starting funding was provided by the U.S. State Department. So essentially it's an NGO that was 
founded by the U.S. State Department and is partly funded by the U.S. State Department. <laughs> and they put out these documents that they've had for between, you know, three and six years, mm-hmm. um, right at a time when the uh, U.S. Congress is is has sent a letter to Trump urging him to escalate in um, in Syria. Um, and there's all this uh, this acrimony flaring between the U.S. and Iran, which is a close ally of Syria. Yeah. So it's I, kind I'm not, of the opportunistic timing. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm not saying that it's necessarily untrue. Uh, what happened? I certainly have some questions about the documents themselves. Yeah. Um, whether they're real or not, I, the there's a good chance that what they describe in there is probably essentially true yeah. if, if not specifically true yeah. um but all the same it just seemed like really convenient timing yeah. and uh so i i'll just say i'm skeptical yeah uh, old saying there's no accidents when it comes to stuff like this especially when it comes to like timing of releasing things yeah rarely are those ever accidents <laughs> Yeah, I, I found it strange, and it immediately I, I sent some emails back and forth with Scott Horton. He wasn't he wasn't even aware of them, which I was really surprised at. Um, yeah. And he actually he's the one that came back at me and said, "Hey, it wouldn't surprise me if they if this stuff happened though, because they certainly were willing to to torture our prisoners." Yeah, I mean, right. like prisoners of For the U.S. Us. Army. Yeah, yeah not, basically doing us a favor, right? Um, so anyway. That I, I just found that interesting, and as long as we're talking about um, U.S. torture programs, uh, Assange is back. Yeah, um, he's he's in jail. They have announced uh, seventeen additional indictments under the Espionage Act. Wow! Um, and they formed a new grand jury, so they had released Chelsea Manning uh, at the end of the old grand jury because they determined that. Um, I, we reported on it anyway. Yeah, I, yeah. I can't remember the specifics of why, but um, they didn't use the, well, it won't coerce her into talking thing because then they couldn't bring her back. Yeah. And they formed this new grand jury and uh, they have arrested Chelsea Manning again. And okay. she is again in jail um, for contempt of court wow. for refusing to testify because against Assange. she's just not going to do this. Like, yeah. There's, yeah. Um, and I actually heard that she should have uh, pled the fifth. Yeah. That she could be free if really? she just pled the fifth um, instead. But uh, then I, I was I, I also read that if she pleads the fifth, it's so you you don't criminalize yourself, like you don't indict yourself, right? Yeah. And but then if they offer uh, her immunity, yeah. then she would be compelled to testify, or she'd be back in the same place. If she doesn't have to fear retribution, then you can't. Yeah. Refuse to can't. testify under the fifth. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't realize that. So if you plead the okay, so if you've gotten immunity, you lose that right then. So, yeah, because you're you're not you can't criminalize yourself. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that either. I huh. um I, I can't remember the name of the attorney that wrote the bit that I read about yeah. that, but he that's, said uh, it's just as well because she might end up in this exact same, same position situation anyway. anyway. Um, if she's going to take a principled stance and refuse to testify in a secret court against yeah. a um, a journalist, yeah, right. Uh, then yeah, it's just as well. This is the way. This, this way. is the way to do it. Then yeah, yeah. Wow. Um. So uh, anyway, and Assange apparently isn't doing well, but it seems like the the U.S. press is actually taking some note this time because there is pretty specific in the indictment them um, criminalizing the activity of publishing information or sharing information with anybody else. So could that be interpreted to mean if you print classified information in the New York Times and then distribute the New York Times that... You could be held liable for that? Yeah. Yeah. Or if I give you a copy of the article from the New York Times or share it with you online or whatever. I was going to say, I mean. Does that that, make me liable? Potentially. I mean, the way it's written, it seems like it. Oh, yeah. Especially like, I mean, you're talking about just holding people accountable for sharing something on Facebook. Yeah. Something going viral and then holding each people, person in the row accountable for that. I mean, it's not practical, but. Well, it's not. You say it's not practical, but Mm -hmm. the way they do the algorithms and the way they track people now online. I mean, it wouldn't be, it's not a far reach to believe they could track it 
track each person that shared it mm -hmm. and and try to hold charges against each person. Yeah, I um I actually read an article from Jacob Hornberger. You remember him? Yeah, we, we met, him met up there convention um at the Future of Freedom Foundation today, where he was saying that you know it's not enough for the press who's actually doing this finally. Yeah. Um, it's not enough for the press to try and uh, push for leniency. Like you can't hold Assange for this. It's just publishing just like the rest of us, you yeah. know, go easy. This is dangerous where you're going, et cetera. It's not enough for them to press for leniency. Yeah. He said, what we need to do is, is try to get the government to abolish the espionage act. Yeah. Like that actually, yeah, actually do something about what's on the books as far as this is concerned. Right. To prevent yeah. it from being used against somebody else in the future. Exactly. Um, and no, I uh, agree with we, that. You know, we've talked about the Espionage Act before in that Schenck case where he was uh, prosecuted under the Espionage Act in World War One for uh, speaking out, handing out flyers against the draft. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, and that's essentially what it was formed for was to, I mean, so, ostensibly... It was created to uh, hold saboteurs and, and spies and so forth accountable. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there's plenty of laws to do that anyway. But in practice, that's not what it does at all. Yeah, in yeah. practice, what they, they used it for was um, to jail people who were speaking out against the war and against the draft. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, I actually I heard an interesting interview with Daniel Ellsberg today that Scott Horton did. Yeah. Um, Daniel Ellsberg is the guy who released the Pentagon Papers. Oh, okay. Uh, right. So, um, and he was talking about the importance of whistleblowers, like, yeah. and uh, what he pointed out, which I found really interesting, is that the um, the whole Manning thing with the um, uh, Iran, or I'm sorry, er, mind on a Iran, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Iraq and Afghan war logs that yeah. were released uh, uh, that you know all the thing like the uh, collateral murder video where the the um, chopper pilots were shooting civilians and killed the um, the journalists and all that stuff that the only people that have been prosecuted under that are the leakers yeah. Not the war criminals. Not the actual people who did the atrocities. And uh, and Trump actually ended up um, pardoning some convicted war criminals on Memorial Day, didn't he? Really? I didn't hear. No, I didn't hear about I mean, that. I heard that he was going to. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that at least some of that happened. Really? But, yeah, they're, they're processing, you know, they're um, indicting uh, Assange under the Espionage Act <laughs> and releasing for— for People releasing who actually... information for releasing information on US government criminal activity. Wow. But they're releasing soldiers who were actually convicted in military court of war crimes. Wow. No, I hadn't that's it's a little backwards. Yes. <laughs> Talk about upside down world. Yeah. So uh anyway, the if that doesn't get your Wednesday started right, then I don't know what will. All right. Um Wow. So uh let's see. Actually, like, um, as long as we're on the Scott Horton thing, I, I do want to talk about this because I think this is interesting. Um, so uh, he did an interview with Grant Smith on the 24th of yeah. May, um, so two weeks ago, I guess now, uh, about the FBI investigation into the Niger yellow cake uranium um, forged documents that were used to justify Iraq War II. Yeah. Um, and there's, I mean... I recommend that people go listen to the interview because it's really interesting um, about how the how um, the U.S. government propagandizes and misuses information and and is perfectly content to to knowingly um, Missile... present to the American people falsified information, like yeah. stuff that they already know is fake that they'll still use to yeah. to justify their actions, um, but. He just, he made this kind of offhand comment that really struck me. Yeah. Um, he talked about the the deference of the U.S. media to the U.S. government at yeah. this point, how that this has been a kind of a shift. And he mentioned specifically um, the uh, when the yellow cake uranium thing came out and the Chappelle show was on, yeah. and um, Dave Chappelle did a skit where he was like 
you know, making fun of this whole thing and literally had like this is the, yeah, yellow like cake, cake man. And, 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 <laughs> the and press so conference. Uh, like this really great satire. Now, anytime you mention the words yellow cake to me, mm-hmm. that skit always comes to mind. Yeah. Like it can't help but to, I mean, that's just, it's just where it goes, man. Well, Dave Chappelle, certainly at that time, was a singular comedian. There's, like, he was an envelope pusher. I mean, yeah. he was and definitely. He's yeah, he's really creative and fantastic, and he he drove to the heart of a lot of things. And uh, but that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get off on Dave yeah. Chappelle. <laughs> um, what we're talking about is that that now, uh, whatever the narrative that the U.S. government is pushing, the media doesn't question it. They don't make fun of it. They don't ask additional questions. They don't challenge them. No. And so my question is, why do you think that is? It's an interesting question. I mean, I, you, the conspiracy minded me wants to think that there's just too much money involved for them to push against. That it's, it always goes back to the money. Yeah. Um, you mean like U.S. government funding or you mean advertisers? Advertisers. It like always, the, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Like the Boeings and the... the yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. We've talked about that on here before. Northrop Grumman, all mm-hmm. of these companies that fund shows like PBS like that's a bit that's because I watch a lot of PBS Mm -hmm. and um and it's all funded through your major war contributors yeah and certainly you like your average news watcher is not going out to buy anything (laughs) from Boeing exactly um but but PBS NewsHour brought to you by Boeing and yeah. Northrop Grumman's the other one that yeah. I always hear. Yeah. Um, and it's just like, wh- how much sense does that make? And Lockheed how, Martin. Is Lockheed another Martin's one. another one. Mm-hmm. And it just makes you wonder, like, how, how can they objectively report on these things? Yeah. Well, I mean, here's the important point I think about that is that clearly advertisements from Boeing or Northrop Grumman or um, Lockheed Martin or Raytheon or General Dynamics or any of those yeah. companies on any news program, they're not advertisements to try and sell their products to the to the consumer, to just, the watcher. To me, it's just an open bribe. Yeah. it's what. So what are they paying for, right? Is exactly. The yeah. Where what Where is this money going? Because, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're they're not advertising to us. I mean, yeah. I mean, there has to be some advantage. There's a them. there's a reason they're giving these people this money. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the other big advertisers on news programs is the uh, the big pharma companies. Pharma companies. Yeah. Well, and so if you watch PBS, it's mainly your war producers. So it's the mm-hmm. Boeing's and all of them. But then if you watch like your, I won't say local news, but um. What is it, your syndicated news like Channel Five, Fifteen, mm-hmm. and all of those? Yeah, that's where you get. It's either Fox, NBC, ABC, Fox, NBC. Whatever, yep. Yeah, yeah, your big whatever. Um, that's where you get into the pharma companies. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's you know you can joke around about it, but you watch those shows. Every commercial just about is something about ED yeah. or some kind of pharma thing <laughs> yeah. that they're pushing on you. Yeah. Well, at least they're they're actually advertising to. The people watching the news in that case, they're yeah. hoping that you get paranoid about whatever <laughs> may be wrong with you and go to your doctor and ask for something specific. Yeah. And I saw, um, I used to listen to uh, Kira Santa Maria's podcast, which is uh, Talk Nerdy. Oh, it, yeah. it started off on HuffPost as Talk Nerdy to me. Yeah. Um, but when she went off on her own, it was just Talk Nerdy. Yeah. And uh, it, it's, it's you know, interviews with scientists primarily, it's... It, it can be really interesting. She doesn't put enough information in her little tags yeah. um, when I see it on iTunes, so I never know what I'm getting into, so I don't listen to it as much as I used to. Yeah. If I don't know who the person is that she's not drawing I don't, in. Yeah. yeah, I don't generally listen to it anymore. And, you know, my time's taken up with other things. But I saw a quote from her at one point. Is like She said something like, uh, if I go to my doctor and I ask him for a specific drug, what's the difference between him and what's the difference between a doctor and a drug dealer? Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely the case. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, I think that the money is certainly uh, that's probably the best answer. <laughs> uh, yeah. Actually, um, my thought went to the power of government. Yeah, and how um, you know how easily that they can shut you down if you report badly. Oh, it's uh, both true. through access and and everything else. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's all this licensing that goes on for these stations to begin with, and then for an individual reporter, um, 
that if you are the White House reporter and they don't let you into the White House, then, well, it's kind of hard to do your job. That's, that becomes a problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it's, you know, a threat of an overpowered government. But actually, I think your, your money answer is probably the better answer. Yeah, I mean, I, at the end of the day, follow the money, man. It's, yeah. it's the driver of all things. That's what my old economics teacher said. If you yeah. want to know about history, follow the money. Yeah. It's the truth. Yeah. I mean, I, I believe that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, there's a lot of that going on. I, uh, I mean, I think that there is a real fear. Like, this kind of brings me, makes me think about the Huawei thing. Yeah. Right, so the U.S. government has... Uh, banned Huawei from working in the U.S. essentially. Like, they can't have products, they can't be a part of the 5G build, and and actually the U.S. government is pushing the EU to do the same thing. Well, I was um, fixed to say there was some interesting news on that yesterday when Trump was talking with Theresa May. Um, he, he Trump emphasized that even though they're, they're working with Huawei, I guess, in their intelligence gathering and stuff, mm -hmm. that there would still be an intelligence agreement between the two companies, despite the fact that they're working with them. Well, it, they're not... Okay, so the EU isn't working, or UK isn't working okay. with Huawei on intelligence things, but they use them for devices. Well, they use them for devices. Oh, that's yeah. what I mean. They're, they're using yeah, so their, their, network. their products. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the concern was that the Chinese are spying through Huawei, then any information that we send to that the U.S. sends to the U.K. will go over a Huawei network when it gets to the U.K., and then it can be siphoned off. And whatever. Exactly. No, but I, I found the whole thing, like, really interesting. First off, yeah. as an American citizen, like, how much do you really care? Like, Huawei, and we don't really have their products here, but yeah. as I understand it from what I've read elsewhere, Huawei makes a really, really great phone. Really? At a really good price. That they are beyond competitive with Apple or uh, or Google. And it's made um, in China? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. The, oh, the Chinese imagine. made something that's actually competitive. Wait, is this, <laughs> like, uh, well, why do you think we're raising tariffs? Is because they make a ton of stuff that's yeah, actually Yeah, but their stuff is all cheap, though, normally. I mean, I've, heard, I've always heard horrible things mm -hmm. about Chinese phones. Yeah, well... Um, Supposedly, at least the high-end Huawei phones are have like a, a wealth of features, yeah. and they're better priced. Yeah. It's like a higher quality product at a lower price. Interesting. That's the claim. I don't know. Never yeah. used one. Well, yeah, because yeah, how would you, right? Never used one. <laughs> but for the average American consumer, yeah, like how concerned are you that the information that you pass through your phone may end up in the hands of the Chinese government? Yeah, and. It, the whole thing seems so hypocritical to me because essentially what the U.S. government is saying is only we can spy on only, our people. Well, I was fixing to say it's not like Google and Facebook and all of these companies aren't already doing the same thing. Yeah. And then we know they're doing the same thing. And we're, there's at least a reasonable uh, assumption that they are passing information to, our, to the U.S. government. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the... I mean, the besides the whole NSA thing, the Snowden well, I was fixing leaks, to say but, the yeah. Snowden leaks kind of tells you everything because I mean, there's no question that that they're collecting this information and keeping it. So, so, um, and I, I think that the their whole argument breaks down as to why it's okay as a result of this too, because if you're saying, well, you can't really get any information from the metadata that we're collecting. <laughs> but we damn sure don't want the Chinese to have but it. But we don't want them to have it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I know. Well, if if it doesn't matter, if you can't get anything out of it, then why do you even care if the Chinese yeah. government gets it? Well, anyway. And there's plenty to be gotten from it because that's it's oh, a marketing yeah. thing. I mean, that's really yeah. what it boils down to, especially the metadata stuff. Well, I mean, a friend of mine at the office did um, um, a breakdown for me. He was like, you know, tracking some stuff or what he did was he dug into some like publicly available metadata on yeah. a person which may be falsified or not. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, um, but he was just looking through it to see what he could suss out. Yeah. And he is like, okay, I, I can essentially identify the person in the end yeah. because I I see where they're going and when. Yeah. Um, so you can assume that the two places that they visit the most are work and home. Yeah. All right. Well, I got geospatial mapping. I mean, I can tell where those places are. Where those are. places are, yeah. So yeah. now I've got his address. 
Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I can just do a reverse lookup to find out who, you know, yeah. I mean, it was, it's not hard to do. It was, yeah. it was insane. Like, he yeah. said, "It's un- unreal how much information what's, you can get out about a one specific person just from metadata." And what's amazing is, is there's no way to opt out or turn it off. Yeah. Um, I saw some things a while back. It's been a year or two ago now, but somebody had actually they took two phones and they put one on airplane mode mm-hmm. and the other turned it completely off. And then they they rode around town all day and visited all these places. It was in D.C. Um, and then when they were done. They hooked the phones up, and the one that was turned off actually collected more information than the one that was in airplane mode. <laughs> and But they both sent all of that information straight back to Google. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, so, it helps, right? I mean, it helps to know what your your customers are into so you can push the right advertisements yeah. out. All and that, then that's what it's about. I mean, it's all about, once again, always goes back to the money. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to be, a lot to be gained in money. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> I wish I had more. All right. As do I. That's a that's a hint to the listeners. But no. <laughs> um. <clears throat> so I don't know what what next. I mean, I guess that actually kind of leads us down to the EU stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, so they just had their elections last week, beginning of last week. Um, there's been some changes. Yeah. Uh, First off, the UK was still part of the EU elections. Um, May has given up. Yeah. And she's actually going to be replaced on Friday or something, like just coming up anyway. Yeah. Um, I heard Trump was meeting with a couple of the candidates, I guess. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Yeah. Boris Johnson is the, is is the, the big one. Runner, like yeah. he's, her, her party in, yeah. was pro-Brexit from the beginning. Yeah. Maybe not the beginning, but anyway. He got on board. Although they're trying to sue him for giving out false information about the results of Brexit or like how much money the UK gave to the EU or something like what the what the UK yeah. the costs to the UK of being part of the EU they say that he falsified this information and um, him being a public figure and falsifying the information led to a change in people's votes and may have affected the ballot. And like, I don't so, know, like, so we're talking about election tampering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in his own country, though. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the whole purpose of a campaign. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, and that's I've never understood the whole election tampering thing. Anyway, like, I mean, that's what it is. Like, I get that you know we don't necessarily want the Russians doing it, but. Like t- to me, tampering is did they mess with votes? Because yeah. Because if, if they didn't mess with votes, all they're trying to do is get their message across. Yeah. No, he influenced people with false information, potentially yeah. false information. Potentially. I don't know. Wow. I, I I think that <laughs> I mean I don't know. I hope that they don't come over campaigns in the U.S. with that. <laughs> yeah. <idea>. All right. <laughs> like. Uh, well, you know, what they said on their campaign wasn't entirely true, so maybe they should go to jail. Yeah. that, that Actually, be, that might be a good thing. I was going to say, that may not be the worst thing in the world. I mean, it would definitely yeah. keep people a little more honest. I say no, a, little, a little more. It wouldn't keep them honest. It no, would it keep, wouldn't, because the people that are doing that stuff are politically connected, and they won't ever... They will never face a... Yeah, they yeah. won't be prosecuted under that's, that. That's true. Um, it, it may be at most a scandal. Yeah. I mean, what prosecution or, or anything has have the Clintons faced for they can't accept money from a foreign government, but the foreign governments can give tens of millions of dollars <laughs> to the Clinton Foundation during election time? Same way with banks. All those speeches they make. Yeah. Yep. Same so. thing. Um but uh, there was some changes in the in the makeup of the EU. Yeah. Uh, I read a really uh, again, um I came across this at antiwar.com, which they don't usually do a lot of political stuff in this way. But yeah. um, And then I heard an interview with this guy later. It's kind of a boring interview. I don't necessarily yeah. <laughs> recommend the interview, but the article was interesting uh, from this guy, uh, Gilbert Doctorow. Um, and uh, he wrote about what the new face of the EU parliament means for war and peace. Mm. Um, and I, so th- just some background on this anyway. The they had centrist parties that controlled the majority in the EU Parliament, yeah. and they actually still control the majority in the EU Parliament, but not a majority on their own. 
yeah. anymore. Like they've got to band together. They're going to have to band together with other groups to to push their yeah. their agenda across. Yeah. Um, the uh, nationalist Eurosceptic parties had some gains, but not a lot. Mostly, it was just a reshuffling of the existing members. They were about a third of the EU Parliament before, yeah. and they still are. Yeah, um, but just shifted just, some things around. Yeah, different parties make up the that third. That, yeah. Um, so you had like Marine Le Pen's party one in France. Um, uh, uh, Geert Wilders in uh, the Netherlands, They his party gained some seats there. So, I mean, actually, I think that this is really good. I, like, I would love to see more Eurosceptics in the European <laughs> Union. Yeah. Um, and, and now after having read this article for more reasons than one. Yeah. Actually, the big winner yeah. uh, was the Green Parties. Yeah. Um, I, I had saw that too, and which largely that's because there were massive protests as far as climate change and stuff leading up to these elections. Yeah. Um, I had saw some coverage on some of that before they had the elections. Yeah. Um, so the what they've done is they've kind of taken their – some of the uh, – the centrist that controlled the parliament and they've spread them out to the extremes. Yeah. So, um, I, I found it interesting that the greens won, uh, although apparently, and this is what the article is about is that the, uh, the greens and the, uh, ALD, which is the Alliance of liberals and Democrats for Europe, okay. which is also a left wing party, yeah. um, that they, they had big gains and then, of course, the far right, um, Marine Le Pen's, uh, the uh, Brexit Party, Nigel Farage's party in yeah. the UK that Brexiteers. replaced UKIP, um, and then uh, the Italian um, nationalist parties uh, that Matteo Salvini is a part of. That they they got some gains as well. Yeah. So they they split to the right and the left, and they lost some of the center essentially in the parliament. Yeah. But what I found interesting about his article is he was saying that the um, the right the far right parties um, are more tolerant of Russia and are less willing to engage in a negative way, in an antagonistic way with Russia. Yeah. Uh, where the ALDE and particularly the Greens, yeah, for some reason, huh. are in favor of just like they support contention with Russia. Interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't realize. I found that. that odd. So he said he was saying his argument was that because the Greens and the ALD E made bigger gains than the far right parties, the left parties made bigger gains than the far right parties, and that the centrist parties are going to have to ally with hmm. some of these newer parties that have gained seats. That it, it may actually push for more antagonism with Russia. Really? Um, because the parties with the biggest gains. Yeah. Promote antagonism with Russia. <laughs> That's interesting. I hadn't heard that. Yeah, um, I thought that, that was. That's interesting. Kind of troubling. Actually, yeah. Too. Um, yeah. I mean, that's just marching you more towards, you know. Yeah. Um, now, something that I have thought has been this has been uh, comedic to me in this whole thing is that yeah. there's like this little spat between uh, Macron and Merkel, yeah. um, Macron of France and Merkel in Germany. Um, about how to select the president of the European Commission at this yeah. point, because yeah. they've had this traditional way that they would select them from the biggest candidates and the biggest parties. Yeah. Um, but the biggest parties are generally uh, dominated by Germans because Germany is the biggest country. Yeah. Right? Wow. And so Macron is trying to push to do it some other way. Yeah. Uh, so that they can, you know, well, push some different people in. And um, obviously Germany wants no part of this. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Germany wants to continue doing it the way they've always done it. Yeah. Um, and Macron wants to change things and he wants to, you know, people with the best resumes, he wants gender equality. Yeah. Um, you know, that there's like four major positions. So he wants two men and two women. Yeah. Um, and you know, so I find that to be, uh, kind of counter to his idea that they need the people with the best resumes. Yeah. Not that necessarily there wouldn't be two men and two women with the best resumes, but yeah. if you're saying that it's more important to have gender equality than the best resumes, then one of those is going to have to give. Yeah. I mean, what happens if they're the be the three best resumes are all women? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, then you're taking uh, somebody lower down the rank so that you can have gender equality. So we can have this equality here. Although somehow I imagine that if it, the three best resumes were women, that they'd they make would be an okay exception. Yeah. With that. But, <laughs> we'll make an exception this yeah. time. 
<laughs> I also consider that really unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, I, I, this little spat between them, I thought has been has been pretty pretty funny. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, the I, I don't know how they're going to resolve it in the end. Um, I actually was listening to a commentator who said uh, that the um, it was somebody on France twenty four. I can't remember who. This was like a week ago, and I, I didn't have anything to write it down when I was listening to it. I was like, you know, getting Late ready in, in the bed, morning, yeah. you know. But um, anyway, he said uh, that the president of the European Commission will be the person that the least number of countries dislike. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I thought, man, that's kind of how it works here, too. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. And so, um, but, uh, you know, if you wanted to talk about uh, climate change, like this, seems like an opportunity. The Greens won big in the they, European. They did elections. win big, yeah. No, that's true. I mean, I don't know. I don't have a whole lot to. I mean, like I say, the it's definitely climate change is marching forward. Like, there's definitely a well, movement. Well, no, there's okay. <laughs> there is definitely a movement that. I mean, my like I say, I have a hard time with this one. I don't. Like I say, I'm not a believer in climate change. I'll put it that way. I'm all for conserving the environment, mm -hmm. but the whole myth that the the climate is always changing, like it's, right. it's so so that's just like a crazy. The whole idea that it's that I don't know. That, yeah, that's that's the thing. All right, this is climate change is nothing new. Yeah, climate has been changing since the beginning of the earth. Yeah, well, and the the big thing they like to do now is focus on well certain areas are more impacted by climate change well areas change like just because yeah. this area has been this way for the past however many hundred years or so yeah doesn't mean it's going to stay that a few way generations it's like within, yeah it's like a know, blink of an eye yeah within the memory of like people that you may have known in your lifetime yeah exactly so um, i mean the we're good you're always going to have that yeah. Whether whether it, whether we're contributing to it or not, mm -hmm. that will always be out there. Yeah, I saw something uh, recently, and I can't remember exactly what it was, so I'm I'm gonna make it up. But it was something like yeah. um, that the climate has been changing faster in the last twenty years uh, than it has changed in in ten thousand years. What? How could you possibly know that? Yeah, like I mean, we don't have like <laughs> <laughs> like there's no way to know that. And like, I know that you can do ice cores and things like that. Well, you, take, there are things you can look at. Yeah, I, I'll, gr I'll grant you, you a, that. Yeah, that'll give you a general idea. But there's no way that you could you could actually like estimate within a a small period of time yeah. how rapid the change happens. Yeah, like you need to look at it all in context. So what you can do mm -hmm. is you can do, all right. So think about it. For those of you that like trade stocks, yeah, okay, like you can look at a graph of the stock market, yeah. and um, you can you can pick a period, like a short period, yeah. like a, a an hour window, okay. where there's a tremendous amount of volatility, where yeah. it goes up and down, up and down, or or way way, way up, up or, or way just, way yeah, down, yeah. but then you can back out, looking at that same chart, yeah. and look at it over the last six months. Yeah. And there's very little change. And it seems as stable as can be. Yeah. But then you can pick a different point within that last, like, tremendous variation again within that within that five-minute segment. Yeah. It doesn't, it, it doesn't have any impact on the whole. Yeah. Like, I mean, it has some impact. Well, it has some whole, impact, but, but... But what I'm saying is that if you're looking at the period since we've been able to measure temperatures consistently, you know, across the globe, yeah. which isn't that long. No. And you're trying to compare it to ice cores where you get essentially samples that cover A thousands snapshot. of years. Yeah. You know, you can't... There's no way that you can compare those two and, and make any kind of determination about the rapidity of change. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm a believer in climate change, but anthropogenic <laughs> climate change, I don't know. We may have some impact. Every, every well, organism has an impact on the climate to some degree, but I, I just don't think that we think have if, the control that they claim. No, I don't think so either. And, I mean, if you're going to get into, like, us having an impact, just like you say, every organism has an impact, there is a ton of us. Like, if anything, overpopulation is going to have more of an impact than anything else that goes on and nobody is calling for us to just start like controlling population yeah i mean um biological uh roots of climate change are the reason that we can live on this earth yeah i mean there was 
almost no oxygen before biology developed and created oxygen. Yeah. There was almost no oxygen on this planet. But then all the algaes started creating oxygen yeah. and dumping tons of it into the atmosphere yeah. and completely changed the climate. Yeah. And it made it possible for, for the us. rest of us to be here. <laughs> yeah. Like so. most of, well, not most by biomass, I don't think, but yeah. um, complex life on this planet uses yeah. oxygen as an energy source. And it wouldn't even be available if the biology that existed before them hadn't created the climate change that made it possible. Yeah. Well, that's... So, anyway, yeah. and the other thing is that anytime you're talking about science, every time I hear them say, the science is settled. <laughs> I, that just, just makes like, you cringe. Oh, yeah, that. absolutely. I'm yeah. so irritated by that because anybody who actually knows anything about science knows that no science is ever settled. No, that's the whole idea behind science. I mean, like you were telling me the other day, like mm -hmm. the theory of gravity, like gravity is not even proven. Yeah, and like I can drop stuff and it falls. Yeah, like. <laughs> it's technically the law of gravity because it's yeah. been, you know, it hasn't been disproved for so long. Yeah. But there's a bunch of questions about whether our understanding of gravity is actually how gravity works. Yeah, exactly. Like the Newtonian idea of gravity, that's the law of gravity, yeah. is definitely in question now yeah. um, because of quantum mechanics. And yeah. they can't get it to fit in with everything else, with their other understand their understandings of other parts of physics. Yeah. And so there are some real questions about whether our understanding of gravity yeah. is correct. Yeah. And, you know, that's been around for 500 and some years yeah right? so it just goes to show you like i say it's never settled like anything all things can change yeah and my position on climate change i'm so i'm all for conservation I, i'm not for like just willy-nilly polluting so I, I i'm okay with that but i just don't buy into the whole propaganda and if you if you're truly worried about climate change to me my thing is we need to work on getting off this planet that yeah. that's where the focus should be because at the end of the day this planet is only what it is and as long as humanity is only occupied here mm -hmm. it's yeah. doomed to fail I, I i think that you're right i have more to add to that but before we move off of science i just want to make one like important point about science yeah. that I, I don't think that a lot of people understand because it's not how science is taught yeah um you know, science is taught in schools, in public schools particularly, but in, I think in schools in general yeah. as a as a set of facts. Yeah. Like these are the things that we know yeah. because of science, and that's not that's not what science is at all. First off, science science is a is a verb, not a noun. It's it's a process. Yeah. Um, but the the thing to remember is that science proceeds by Question. falsifying. Yeah. Well, it, questioning it moves, everything. Yeah, it moves forward by falsifying ideas, yeah. not by proving ideas. It doesn't yeah. prove anything. Yeah. What, uh, the only things that it proves is it proves what can't be true. Yeah. And then you just work with your best idea after that, your best theory after that, and you could, and you try to disprove it. And if yeah. you can't disprove it, then it eventually gets accepted as as a you know as a law like gravity. Yeah. Because they haven't been able to disprove it. Yeah. But now they're you know. It, it, it hasn't been proven. It was yeah. never proven, and it yeah. never will be proven. It can't yeah. be proven. Yeah. Um, it science proceeds through falsification. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, in terms of climate change, uh, I think the answer is prosperity. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, we're you know we were talking, and and that can lead to moving to another planet. Obviously, like the, you need some wealth <laughs> to do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think well. that if you want to, if you want to fix the problem if you want people to make choices that are responsible in terms of conserving the environment yeah. that what you need to do is you need to free up the markets yeah. that you need to reduce restrictions you need to give people the opportunities to to accumulate and generate wealth yeah. and that's the only way that that it'll and happen then they'll because, make the better decisions right because nobody's making the choice to you give people the opportunity with prosperity to make choices based on their conscience instead of on the balance of their checkbook yeah oh that's, yeah that's because, the difference because at the end of the day that's where it once again it goes back to the money that's where the decisions are made can i afford to do this or can't i can i afford that green car or mm -hmm. do i need to keep my old yeah. combustible car right because yeah. it, it costs less. Yeah. And the more people are able to make the choice to choose green energies, because they are, at least currently, yeah. more expensive. Oh, yeah. There's no yeah. question. 
um, is the more people can make the choice to use green energies, the more demand you create for green energies, the more money is invested into green energies, the better the technology gets. Exactly. And maybe someday it will catch up with with uh, yeah. non-renewable sources yeah. in terms of cost and efficiency and so forth. And I but right now it doesn't. And forcing people to make that choice ends up costing the people that have the most to lose. Yeah. Or No, actually, they have the least. Yeah. yeah. That, that's really the problem yeah. is that you what you do is you, you put an undue burden on the people that are in the worst shape. Yeah. Well, and subsidizing it through the government just doesn't get you there. Yeah. I mean, it, that's been proven over and over again. Like, I mean, it just it doesn't. It's not the way forward. They did okay in Brazil when they moved to the uh, ethanol economy for the cars and so forth. I mean, there were yeah. huge subsidies to, to move out the you know the petroleum industry and move in the, the alcohol industry yeah. in order to... Um, I mean, they placed a bunch of restrictions. They said all cars have to be... Um, ethanol or methanol or you know have to be uh, alcohol uh, fuels yeah. by such and such a date um, the government set up all these uh, fueling stations for ethanol and, and what have you I think yeah. it's ethanol that they use ethanol methanol whatever anyway an yeah. alcohol fuel base yeah. um, and like you know they did okay yeah um, but I, I think that again you're better off yeah. you're better off with the choice giving people the choice yeah um, I did want to talk, I mean, we've, <laughs> we haven't addressed like most of this stuff, which I, you yeah. know, I wanted to talk about the Mueller statements, but I'd say it's hardly worth it. I, you know, yeah. there's some things in there. Maybe we'll address it if we run out of stuff to talk about next time around. Yeah. But, um, Push that back a week, maybe. I, I did want to, you know, give us the opportunity that, um, so yesterday was the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square, uh, incident. Yeah. Massacre. Massacre. Can, massacre is what we call it here. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say really, the, like, because the the sources are are bad. Somewhere between three hundred and three thousand students were killed by yeah. um, Chinese military uh, during their protests for democracy in Tiananmen Square. Yeah, uh, they weren't actually. First off, I, I I think my understanding is that they weren't protesting for democracy so much. Weren't they? Wasn't it more for like Mao or? Yeah, yeah. There that's, was a lot of because I did um, some reading when you said you wanted to talk about this, and that's more of what I got from it. Yeah, they Although wanted it was to go, hard to find solid information. It, it is. Uh, is it's hard to find solid information, and certainly the the West has spun it in a particular way. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, my my research came up with the same thing yeah. that they were actually getting frustrated by um, the. Um, Deng, D E N G. Deng was the the guy in charge at the time. Anyway, yeah. he was liberalizing markets, yeah. and that they were actually pushing for uh, to go back to a, like a to pure happen, communist, yeah. like Maoist yeah, that's... form of socialism. Um, and so, like, we don't really need to go deep into the history, but what I wanted to talk about mostly with this is that this is one of those misconceptions. Um, that I come across a lot. I, I don't know how much you talk to people about this, but if you ask most most people, especially younger people, if there is more or less poverty in the world than there was 30 years ago, yeah. they will tell you that more. Yeah. Well, same thing happens when you talk about crime rates. Mm. Anytime you ask people, crime's going up, it's going up, it's going up. Yeah. Well, and that's all fine and good until you start digging in and looking at the numbers. Yeah. And then you start looking, it's like, wow, like some of our, like, I mean, maybe there's some areas where that's true, but there's specific areas. They're not, they're not the overall rule. Right. Yeah. In general, crime has gone down yeah. um, and poverty has gone down. Yeah. Tremendously. Really? Tremendously. I haven't looked, that one I haven't looked into, but. And here's the reason why. Yeah. Is because the Chinese and the Indians liberalized their markets. Yeah. The, you know, the, and it pulled Hundreds of million, hundreds of millions of people, <laughs> people. Yeah. out of poverty. Interesting. Um, and so that's the that's the big takeaway from this, and that's what yeah. they were, as far as I can tell, the majority of protesters. That's what they were protesting against. Yeah, um, yeah. was the liberalization of these markets. Yeah. And this also, by the way, just as a side note, is why I'm not really concerned about China in the long run. Yeah. First off, in a lot of ways, they have a freer market than 
than we do or than yeah. Europe does. Yeah. Um, and they have these uh, economic free zones or special economic zones, or I can't remember what they call them, where there's essentially no rules. No regulation at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, Whatever you want to do. Yeah. yeah. And those places are tremendously prosperous. Yeah. Um, they have taken free market to a, a level that we haven't had in a long time. A long, in, I was going to say, since, yeah, since um, the beginning, really. Now, am I suggesting that we go to the Chinese form? No, not at all. Uh, because <laughs> yeah. they have an a, extremely oppressive government. There is a lot oh, yeah. of political and social control, and I'm not well, yeah, in and favor that, of that's that. Well, yeah, and that's where the rubber really hits the road. Like, they're... Like as far as like the internet goes, like the internet there is not what the internet is here. Like it's extremely censored, mm-hmm. and they track people everywhere. Like I was reading oh, yeah. some stuff a while back about the way they keep up with the Chinese people, and like there were the U.S. is kind of taken is behind them as far as in this category, but we're heading that direction yeah. where like the government just knows where every person is all times, yeah. all day, every day. Well, and they're doing the social score thing. You've yeah, about they that, do that right? too. Like, yeah, I, that, this this was actually separate from that, but I've heard of that too. Mm-hmm. Um, where they, yeah, they grade you based on your, I guess, I, yeah, like all kinds of things that you do, things that other people say about you, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and it all gets wrapped up into some kind of composite score, and they yeah. use that score to determine what you have access to. Yeah. Is that not insane? It's crazy. Um. And so, oh, uh, like, I, what a, what a oh, I saw an interesting system. thing. It was probably also on France 24. I think they did a, uh, an interview with a Chinese journalist who um, was a, an undesirable as a, result, <laughs> or as, a, as a result of his social score because of the, the reports that he'd done really? about the Chinese government, that, they, you yeah. know, that he was critical in some ways. And so he was somebody who was like a, almost a non-entity. Yeah. He didn't have access to lots and lots of things because – his social score had dropped to a level where they cut him off from wow. a whole bunch of stuff. I'm telling you, it, we can head that direction, man. It's Well, I mean, I don't think that we're that far from moving that well, direction. No, we're, we're, we're already we're moving that direction. Thinking. We're not that far from being there Yeah, is, is kind of my point. Yeah, I don't know that we're on the fence, but we're approaching it. We're approaching it pretty freaking hard. Um, and the thing, what's even crazier about us here in the U.S. at least, is we're not, at least in China, I say at least, but in China, the government is the catalyst for all of that. Here in the states, the social justice warriors and the, mm-hmm. I mean, it's actually a group of people that are the catalyst for this. Yeah. Even more so than the government. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly who is um, pushing people off of platforms and yeah, so forth. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. Well, I, the the point that I wanted to make though was the the value of of a free market economy to them. Yeah. And like I said, this is why I'm not concerned about them in the long run. Yeah. Is because at some point they've allowed this wealth into their country. Yeah. I mean, there's like now that you have a real, like a burgeoning middle class in, in China and the, there's a point at which people won't stand for the the social and political control. Yeah. I I think they're, they're heading towards another um, social and political revolution. It's um, possible. And it's going to be the result of the free market. Yeah. Well, it's the result of, of, of prosperity, I would guess. You yeah. Know? Uh, well, yeah. you know, directly, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. So I, I think that they're not really a, a concern in the long run. And truthfully, the whole tariffs thing that we're doing now. Yeah. I mean, again, I, it's a waste. I yeah. the you wanted to talk about the tariffs with Mexico, though. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. If we've got just, I mean, we're we're blowing time tonight. Let's just blow it out the water. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. I mean, we might as well. We're here. I really we're, wanted we're to talk after right? this, but it, it's getting late. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. As far as the only thing I really wanted to say, so I, for the people who haven't heard, uh, Trump put out a tweet the other day saying that he was going to raise tariffs on Mexico, I think starting this week, to 5%. And I guess every month it's going to go up by so many percent till I think it caps at like 25%. And this is all in an effort to make Mexico do their part to stop the influx of people coming into our country through their border. Mm -hmm. Um, And while I don't support tariffs generally, I kind of am on board with this one. Um, 
and in a vacuum where this was the only tariff war we were fighting, I would probably back Trump in this one. Yeah. I mean, I would I would be a supporter of this. Now, given everything that's going on tariff wise, it kind of terrifies me because <laughs> we're, we're it's kind of like you're playing the game of chicken. So not only were we playing with Mexico now, we were already playing with China and the UK, like everywhere you look, we're fighting tariff wars. Yeah. Um, and so I, I can't really support that, obviously, because I'm not a supporter of tariffs. But as far as a way to punish Mexico for something they're doing on our border, I don't so much have a problem with it. I, 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 was, I was digging what you were saying right up until you said punish. Well, it's, um, it, it's a way. I mean, it's a, it does. Granted, it's going to hurt us, too, mm-hmm. because it, it's nothing but a tax and it's yeah. a tax that we will pay. But it's it's a way to try to move Mexico in line. I like I say, I'm okay with it. Yeah, I um I I think that you should change the word punish to um no coerce isn't good. How about uh, to incentivize? Incentivize. Okay. Incentivize Mexico to do their part to prevent people moving through their country into our country because yeah. they do a pretty fair job actually of keeping people out of their country when well, they want to. And it, well, and that's kind of the point um, because some of the stuff they're doing, we're just like allowing caravans to move through. I mean, they could, they could put an end to that immediately if they wanted to. Yeah. Um, and I think that if you push them hard enough with the tariffs, I mean, it, that may be a way, I mean, I always took it with, on the campaign trail when Donald Trump talked about, we're going to build a wall. Mexico is going to pay for it. Like, I literally thought that was a joke throughout the whole campaign. Like, there's yeah. absolutely, and I get what he's trying to say. There was At an the, actual plan on his campaign website. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure there was, but the whole idea of trying to do it through tariffs, I mean, we would, if you did it just through, because what I took it as, we're going to take the money from the tariffs and build the wall. Well, to me, if you're going to, we're still paying for that. Like that's still us paying because we're paying those tariffs. Yeah, and and I mean we're paying them on the back end, but we're still paying it. Yeah. But the idea to actually use it as leverage to make them do what we want them to do, as far as like stop letting people flow through your country, mm. that's actually not that bad of an idea. Yeah, I, I I'm on the fence on this one. I haven't really formed a strong opinion. I'm so opposed to tariffs generally, and I don't. Yeah. This is another form of warfare. It this is. is an ally of ours on our southern border. An ally that's letting people flow into our country. Well, I mean, they're letting people flow through their country. They're not... To come to our country. Yeah. Because it's not like they let them stop. It's not like once they get to their country, they're like, oh, well, you can stay here. No, no, no. Yeah. No, that is not allowed. Yeah. I, no, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I think that... Like, if ever there was a justification for tariffs, the idea of using them to coerce a behavior that we want out of an ally that we have strength over in terms of, like, economic strength over. Yeah. Um, but, again, like, particularly, like, I, I, I would be more willing to have a discussion about it if we weren't yeah. raising tariffs with China, raising tariffs with the well, EU. And that's ra- my position. Like I say, if, if this was the only area we were dealing with the tariffs in this way right now Mm -hmm. i could support it i really have a hard time though given everything else we're doing because i do think that we're we're asking for some huge punishment in our own economy particularly with what we're doing with china um china's the one that worries me the most because all of this cheap stuff we're getting is fixing to get really expensive Mm -hmm. and that that really affects you and it's not uh, good it is yeah as far as what i do for a living that it's gonna have an impact and i'm waiting for it because i mean it's already started but it hadn't been bad but i worry come this holiday season we're in for some turbulent times yeah i mean and maybe not maybe i'm wrong but I, the writing I'm seeing on the wall is is worrisome. So. Well, um, we've on blown that, time up, man. Yeah, <laughs> on, on that uh, apocalyptic. Uh, <laughs> Come on, you don't have a positive quote you can drop us out on, I, man. I, I've got a good quote, actually. I was I was looking through some stuff that I've got in my little notebook that I carry around to see what might apply. And yeah. actually, I think I found a good one from Chris Ann Hall. Oh, nice. All right. So, um, Chris Ann Hall is a, uh, she's an attorney that has, is no longer practicing law. She, um, travels the country teaching the constitution. Yeah. And she is, if you get the opportunity to see her, I highly recommend it. She's oh. a very 
entertaining and exciting lecturer. She there's a lot of passion. Man, if we could get and, her for one of the LP conventions, that would just be insane. Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, she does a lot of uh, teaching constitution to like law enforcement groups and things like that. Yeah, which is which is fantastic. Um, and she teaches the constitution as expressed by the the founding fathers not by from, court precedent well that, and it's you know. it really is more from their perspective mm-hmm. is what i took when i when oh yeah absolutely yeah. i mean it's based on their writings i mean yeah. if whenever somebody says well you know it's this could be interpreted in multiple ways well no it really can't because the <laughs> the the people who wrote the constitution wrote a lot wrote reams and <laughs> reams about why they chose what they chose and why they they right. structured it the way they did there's information out there there's nothing that's in question yeah like it's Agreed. it's all available yeah <laughs> um and she's studied extensively on their writings and and it shows and she's she's very passionate about what she teaches and that comes through too that's absolutely it's really she's really fantastic to see and i highly recommend it you can also look her up on youtube she's got a bunch of lectures on youtube and they're um, good anyway so uh and i can't remember where i i pulled this from but it struck me it might just have been one of her podcasts i'm i'm not even sure um but it seems to apply like maybe on the whole of the things that we've talked about tonight so here it goes all right lost lessons must be repeated you do not change that history. What you do create is a resentment among your neighbors. You deny your children valuable lessons and doom our posterity to repeat the mistakes of our past. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, on that note, which I guess it wouldn't really... <laughs> <laughs> that was positive as we were looking for, but no. we'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, we're going to call it a night. And I think it's too late for me to cook chicken like I was planning. But oh well. Um, and... Uh, you know, in the meantime, while well, I'm maybe cooking chicken, maybe not, um, you can follow us on Facebook, uh, subscribe on iTunes, um, or what's the Google one that we use? Podbean. Oh, Podbean. Yes. Yeah. Um, or Podbean. Uh, leave us comments. I- I'm actually, I'm going to start giving out my email address again here. So if you have any comments or you have any questions and you want to direct them to me, uh, you can get it to me at michael at the liberty dot com. Um, I'd be happy to hear from you. And uh, let's see. I, I won't give out your email address. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So that's iTunes, Facebook, Podbean. Email Mike. <laughs> Michael at the Liberty uh, And then, of course, there's our, our uh, webpage. Oh, yeah. The Liberty Yep. Um, I write occasionally. I haven't in a long time. <laughs> I'll admit, I get like three quarters of the way through articles, and then I'm like, "Damn, I don't know how to end this," and and I get stuck, and then I look at it for a while, and then it's no longer relevant, and so I never end up finishing it. Yeah, I mean, I write that first seventy five percent, eighty percent in like a Solid. few hours, and then I'm like, ah, how, oh, yeah. I, "How do I close this?" Hmm. Oh well, it's a curse. Um, and uh, so I hope you join us again, and we'll we'll try to get it right then. And um, so in the meantime, try to stay free. Ciao. Later.